Welcome to episode 20 of Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. I'm going to apologize right now because I'm feeling a little congested and I'm going to sound super nasally today. (laughs) This is the last episode in October, so the pressure was on to pick a really creepy story. Last week, I covered Ed Gein, which is hard to beat, uh, but I did want to own up to a mistake that I made. Someone on TikTok brought it to my attention that the photos I posted may not all be the original items from his farmhouse. They thought that the nipple belt was too offensive to photograph, so the picture I had was actually a replica. Also, the high-heeled shoes and purse I spoke about were Ed Gein-inspired items that were inaccurately posted on a site I was using for research. So, my bad. (laughs) The face mask of Mary Hogan and the corset bodysuit were legit photos. I try really hard to be accurate with my research, so I'm bummed I messed that up. This week, I'm talking about events from the LaLaurie Mansion in New Orleans, Louisiana. This story is extremely graphic and sadistic. If you have a weak stomach, you might have a rough time with this one. Marie Delphine McCarty was born March 19, 1787, into a rich New Orleans socialite family. At this time, her uncle was the governor of the Spanish-American provinces in Louisiana. Her cousin was the mayor of New Orleans from 1815 to 1820, so a pretty hoity-toity family. In this era, just about everybody with money had slaves. In 1791, the Haitian Revolution started. It was an uprising of slaves against their owners in Haiti. Now, this type of revolt doesn't usually end well for the slaves, but in 1804, Haiti became free from slavery, which is amazing, like so ahead of the times. This caused fear in the southern U.S. People didn't want their slaves rebelling against them and starting a revolution. The result? People with slaves became very harsh with their punishments, like sadistically harsh. This happened when Delphine was just a young girl, so she spent her whole life witnessing her family abuse their slaves. In the year 1800, Delphine married her first husband when she was just 14 years old. He was a high-ranking Spanish officer. I'm not even going to try to attempt pronouncing his name. It's like 10 names long and my Spanish sucks. In 1804, Delphine became pregnant with their first child. Her husband was promoted to Consul General for Spain in the territory of New Orleans. The two were traveling to Madrid when suddenly he died. Just a few days later... Delphine had their baby, a girl she named Marie. The now-widowed Delphine and her baby headed back to New Orleans. In 1808, Delphine remarried. Her second husband's name, slightly easier to pronounce, a wealthy lawyer named Jean Blanc. They had four children together. Are you ready for this? Marie-Louise... Louise Marie, another Marie Louise, and a boy named Jean-Pierre. Maybe it was common to name multiple children the same name in these days, but this sounds confusing as hell. (laughs) I only have one child and I still call him the dog's name half the time. I don't think I could keep straight that many Maries. She became a widow once more when Jean Blanc died in 1816, another mysterious death. I can't find a lot of info on what exactly happened to either husband. 
but the life expectancy was only like 30 to 40 years old in the 1800s. So who knows? In 1825, Delphine married her third husband, Dr. Louis Leonard LaLaurie. It's a lot of L's. He was actually quite a bit younger than Delphine and very attractive. The truth was, this marriage didn't happen because they were in love. Louis only married her because he had gotten her pregnant, and he was not excited about it. He had written a letter to his brother stating that he made a mistake by sleeping around, and now he was forced to marry, quote, the worst woman in town. Louis was a physician and also in the Creole socialite circle. The two never really had a good relationship and didn't spend much time together. In 1831, Delphine purchased a corner lot on Royal Street and began the process of building a mansion. She did this all on her own without any involvement from Louis. It was enormous and took over a year to complete construction. The mansion was a central location in New Orleans, and they frequently hosted fancy socialite parties. Louis lived in the mansion, but in 1832, Delphine filed for separation from bed and board from her husband. Even though he didn't live there any longer, he still attended the social aid balls with Delphine. They built living space for her slaves. I'm curious as to how many slaves one family needs. The LaLauries must have had quite a few because from 1830 to 1834, there were 12 reported slave deaths at their residence. It doesn't state if these deaths were from disease, natural causes, or other reasons. One documented death was 12-year-old Leah. Supposedly, Leah was brushing Madame LaLaurie's hair. Now, we have all brushed our hair before. It's not always a perfect pass. Sometimes you hit a knot and it tugs at your scalp. Well, that's exactly what happened when little Leah was brushing. Madame LaLaurie became infuriated with her for pulling her hair and jumped up and grabbed her whip. Leah was terrified and started running down the hall away from Delphine. She ran as far as she could but kept going up and up until she was on the roof. Madame LaLaurie followed her up onto the roof. She raised the whip and Leah inched as far away as she could, but she slipped and fell to her death. Delphine buried Leah's body in the backyard to avoid any negative attention. But that plan didn't work. A neighbor saw what happened and rumors swirled about the death of the young girl. An investigation into mistreatment of the LaLaurie slaves was conducted. There was a French law called the Code Noir, or the Black Code. It stated that even though you owned a slave, you cannot be excessively cruel to them. After the LaLauries were investigated, they were forced to sell nine of their slaves due to improper treatment. The unfortunate thing was these slaves were purchased by other family members and ended up right back at the LaLaurie mansion, probably to be treated even worse than before. Because this happened so long ago, this is another story that is hard to confirm facts. A lot of what I found in my research were accounts from people who had visited the mansion. Some say that Madame LaLaurie was just like any other socialite in that time and did not treat her slaves poorly. Others reported that she chained her cook to the stove. She would supposedly beat her own daughters if they attempted to be nice to the slaves or give them food. Leah was not the only slave who fell, or jumped, to their death. 
there was a man who was so scared of his severe punishments that he jumped out of a third-story window. That window was cemented shut and still is to this day. I'll post some pictures of Madame LaLaurie. Well, more like depicted drawings. There aren't any actual photos of her, as well as the mansion on my social media. April 10th, 1834. The LaLauries were hosting another fancy party. They went all out with a four-course meal and even had an orchestra. While the attendees were enjoying their hors d'oeuvres, smoke started filling up the ballroom. Firemen and police showed up and discovered that the fire started in the kitchen. To their surprise, there was a 70-year-old black woman chained to the stove by her ankle. She admitted that she actually started the fire on purpose. It was an attempt to kill herself. She wanted to be put out of her misery. Every day she was chained to the stove and beaten. She knew that the slaves that were taken to the attic to be punished were never seen again. She would rather take her own life than die at the hands of Madame LaLaurie's torture. All the party attendees had fled the building once the fire was discovered. They asked Dr. LaLaurie who was helping the slaves. He responded, quote, There are those who would be better employed if they would attend to their own affairs instead of officiously intermitting with the concerns of other people. End quote. Uh, dude, they're just trying to get everyone out safely. That's their job. The police asked Madame LaLaurie for the keys to the slaves' quarter so they could evacuate. She refused to give them the key. What are these two hiding? Over 2,000 townspeople had flocked outside the mansion to see what was happening. They had heard of her abuse on the slaves, and when they found out that she was denying the key, they formed an angry mob. They barged into the house and broke down the door to the slaves' quarters. What they found locked in the attic was beyond anyone's horrific imagination. There were seven slaves chained to the walls. Some, you could tell, had been there much longer than others, skin and bones, and on their last breath. There were even reports of corpses still being kept in the attic with the current victims. Maybe that was an act of torture in itself showing the slaves chained up what their future holds. This story has been told for many years and may have gained some embellishments over time. It's hard to know exactly what is truth. But I'm going to tell you the story of the Mad Madame and why the LaLaurie Mansion is still a hotspot tourist attraction in New Orleans. When the townspeople broke down the doors, the slaves weren't just chained up. They were mutilated, completely covered in scars. Fresh wounds festering with maggots. Blech. That is just the one thing that totally grosses me out. And I'm a dental hygienist. I see some disgusting things on a daily basis. It takes a lot for me to be grossed out, but maggots? That's it. <laughs> A common form of punishment for slaves was their iron collars worn around their neck. They had spikes facing inward, so you couldn't move much without being stabbed. Forget about trying to sleep. One girl was forced inside of a small box. Her bones were broken so that she would fit inside. The LaLauries must have had a thing for breaking bones. Another girl was extremely deformed. They had broken her bones and reset them to heal in a way that resembled the form of a crab. A man had a hole in his skull. Next to him on the wall hung a wooden stick. They used the stick to 
stir his brains. Now, I'm no doctor, but I'm not sure how you can live through that. <laughs> A hole in your head, for starters, and stirring brains? At the very least, the man would be brain dead, if not dead, dead. One woman had animal feces placed into her mouth and then her lips were sewn shut. These accounts of slave mutilation were written about by Jean Delavine in her 1945 book, Ghost Stories of Old New Orleans. The slaves were, quote, stark naked, chained to the wall, their eyes gouged out, their fingernails pulled off by the roots. Others had their joints skinned and festering. Great holes in their buttocks where the flesh had been sliced away. Their ears hanging by shreds. Their lips sewn together. Intestines were pulled out and knotted around naked waists. End quote. Okay, I lied. The other thing I can't handle is the thought of fingernails being pulled off. Like, ugh, just gives me the willies. I know there are much worse things I just mentioned, but there's just something about fingernails. In the midst of the angry mob flooding the mansion, Madame LaLaurie and her driver got away. She is said to have ended up in Paris, but no one knows that for sure. The mansion was ransacked and vandalized. People were pissed that she escaped and would not have to pay for the crime she had committed. I think that it's definitely true that she was cruel to her slaves. How far she went with her punishments, we will never know. Some believe she was the first victim of yellow journalism. Remember, I had talked about that in my H.H. H. Holmes episode. It was popular in the 1800s for stories to be embellished, some completely fabricated to make better headlines. In my research, I found that a lot of owners treated their slaves very badly. Plantation workers would tie their slaves naked to posts, all four limbs stretched out and facing down, and then whip them bloody. Fanny Smith was the owner of a brothel in New Orleans. She branded two young boys with hot irons. There's another story of a slave owner who whipped a breastfeeding woman over a hundred times with a wet leather strap. She didn't think she was able to do her job well since she had to keep stopping to feed her baby. She attempted to, quote, seal her nipples off with hot tongs so that she could no longer breastfeed. This seriously hurts my heart to read what these people endured. But after hearing these other accounts, maybe Madame LaLaurie wasn't much worse than the other slave owners at that time. Don't get me wrong, none of this is okay. I'm just saying that she was definitely not the only one giving harsh punishments. Her story became infamous because everyone knew her and her huge mansion in the city. Plus, people actually saw the poor souls with their own eyes. After the LaLauries left, the mansion was cleaned up and converted into apartments. One of the tenants living there was murdered. It is said that the mansion is haunted by the spirits of the slaves who died there. I can't find the exact details of this murder, but French Quarter Phantoms Ghost Tours said that, quote, the unusual nature of his death suggested ties to paranormal activity. I would love to know exactly what that means. Yes, you heard me right, ghost tours. If you ever visit New Orleans, the LaLaurie Mansion is one of many spooky tourist attractions available. People have seen orbs darting across the cameras while trying to take pictures of the mansion, as well as actual apparitions seen peeking out of the second-story windows. 
if you are an American Horror Story fan, then this might all sound a little familiar. In season three, Coven, Madame LaLaurie was a character played by Kathy Bates. However, American Horror Story put their own little spin on it. I actually haven't watched that season. I'll have to take a break from true crime and watch a little spooky fiction again. I really enjoyed season five, Hotel, with Lady Gaga. Well, that wraps up today's episode. You can find the source information used listed on the show notes. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, press pause and go leave me a five-star review. It really helps with the visibility of my podcast. Show your love and help support the show by giving a donation, buymeacoffee.com slash killerstories. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Killer Stories Podcast. Twitter handle is at Killer Stories PC. My email for story suggestions is killerstoriespodcast at gmail.com. The website for listening is killerstories.buzzsprout.com. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with your true crime loving friends. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this has been a killer story.